involved in citizen actions organizing cooperative, and uh, we're starting to work on these issues as I'll get into, um, and just personally for as long as we've known about this since the late 1980s, I've been very alarmed about climate change and know we need to do something about it, and so that's why I'm here. Uh, to lead it off, I'm just going to ask a couple questions. You guys are educated. I'm guessing you'll get them right away. Um, people know that uh, about 14,000 years ago, uh, we were still in an ice age, and at that point, we had hundreds or maybe thousands of feet of ice right where we're standing, right all the way up to the North Pole. Does anybody know what the temperature difference global average was then and now? How many degrees Celsius temperature difference was there between the last ice age and right now? Oh, it's good. I'm stumping you. I can't believe it. Okay, uh, 10 is the guess. That's a good guess. Actually, it's, it's between 5 and 6 is what generally what it is. And uh, does anybody know, like, what really, these are not even necessarily horror story scenarios, what one of the likely scenarios is for the temperature difference between now and 2100 at the end of the century if we continue business as usual with climate with emitting greenhouse gases? Five or six. Five or six. So you, you can imagine what, how different the world was 14,000 years ago. I mean, Florida was twice as big. The oceans were that low, right? We'd be sitting under a mile of ice. And it's going to be, the world's going to be the other direction, five degrees. And it's going to be a different world. And I've been alarmed about this for a long time. There's going to lot, be a lot fewer people on such a world. And the amount of hardship and suffering which most of us spend our lives trying to, um, to stop is going to be more immense than it's ever been in human history. So that is a critical thing. Now then, the other part of this is, does anybody know um, what the disparity is? Where, where Metro Milwaukee ranks in the nation as far as the unemployment gap between African Americans and white people? Okay, I up there. We're actually number one, the biggest gap there is. And like our poorest zip code, 50, uh, 53206, literally has like 60% unemployment for African-American men. And uh, again, I, like me, we've lived our whole lives with these conditions, right? And people wring their hands and say, you know, what can you really do about that, right? That we've got this level of inequality and this level of suffering going on, just this is how our economy works, as if it's just natural. And uh, the truth is we can do something about that too, the same way we can do something about the climate change. And I think a lot of us are just tired of wringing our hands saying, look what Trump's doing, look how terrible it is, look what ExxonMobil and the Koch brothers are doing, how terrible, and we want to do something solid about it, and we have opportunities to do it. So um, to that end, uh, within the past few months, a coalition has been coming together in Milwaukee of uh, various groups that basically want to act locally. We know at the national level, with the current federal government, there's not a whole lot we can do, right? They're going to be hostile, they have to be fought in the courts in every which way, but, you know, literally you got the fox guarding the hen house. State level, not much better here, but there's still action at the local level, potentially. So uh, different groups have come together um, basically to push for uh, significant action in Milwaukee and maybe beyond in the Milwaukee area, where we can do a lot locally, actually, both to address climate change and to provide real economic opportunity where, for decades, it has not been available to people. And so uh, we've distributed agendas. I'll just tell you very briefly, we're going to start kind of with overviews on the urgent need for action. Um, then we're going to talk about the campaign that we've been hatching in Milwaukee, the allied groups. Uh, then we're going to get a presentation on what's been done in some other locales, because actually there's been successes, really inspirational uh, efforts that hopefully we can copy in other areas. Um, then we're going to get really concrete uh, in the next couple segments to talk about what will this look like in Milwaukee. You know, you can use your imagination, get inspired about actually what Milwaukee could look like if we accomplish what we're trying to do here. And then we're going to have a collaborative activity because uh, in our minds, uh, having a dozen people in a room representing different organizations hatching all the plans is not our ideal about how change occurs. Change should occur with everybody in this room and way beyond actually being able to weigh in and contribute to what we're trying to accomplish and what it looks like. So we're, that's going to be the last segment before we get to next steps. So just very briefly, I'll just talk about who some of the coalition partners are so you know that are involved in this. Um, we're going to have presentation. People have been involved from Sierra Club. Sierra Club, someday I'm going to learn about Sierra Club structure. I, but I don't really quite get it, but various chapters. It's a great grassroots organization are involved, including uh, the Greater Waters uh, Group and the John Weir chapter and the Beyond Coal campaign. Uh, so Sierra Club is one partner. Another partner is 350.org. Do people know what 350.org is? 
What does that number 350 represent? Parts per million. 350 parts per million, right, the concentrations of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And what's the current concentration? 410. Yeah, it's, it's approaching 410. So we're in trouble already, right? And Bill McKibben helped found this. I think McKibben, if there is a national leader of the climate movement or global leader, I think it's Bill McKibben. Third group is Citizen Action. That's who I'm with. Citizen Action is an increasingly grassroots organization that's worked for years on things like fair elections and health care and economic justice. And very recently, by way of our Economic Justice Committee, we decided to get involved in a climate campaign because we see it as a way to right the wrongs that, are, that, that have been persisting in our society as far as inequality, especially based on race. And then um, we also have people here from REAMP. REAMP uh, is a big deal in the climate movement. Uh, it's a network of 130 different organizations in a bunch of Midwestern states that's helping a lot of activity occur. And uh, we have somebody who actually is from one of the affiliated organizations, Cool Choices, who's going to be presenting. And uh, finally, we have somebody presenting from People's Action. People's Action is a national network uh, in 30 different states that Citizen Action is part of, among a lot of other groups. And uh, they actually have been making people in the planet doing something about climate and uh, our economic injustice a primary thing that they're doing nationally. So that's who's presenting here. Uh, hope that it's useful, and we hope that people can contribute and be part of it. We really need to grow this and make it a huge coalition if we're going to change things the way they work. So first part of this, I'm going to turn it over to Robert Craig. He's no relation to me. Yeah. Got nothing to do with him. Uh, the executive director of Citizen Action, and he'll, he'll give you the overview. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And I am Robert Craig, executive director of Citizen Action of Wisconsin. And I hope, and I think it's actually possible, that one day you, you will remember being here tonight. Because what we're hoping to do is launch something very big and very significant. And we definitely need it. Now, I'm going to give you some negative information, but I want, you to, I want to end, you to end hopefully, because I really think that all of this is possible if we use the full agency of our democracy, that is us organizing together to change our society at the local level. We're not trying to pass a big federal bill. This is something that we can impact with hundreds of people as opposed to millions of people. Um, so Ted had mentioned just the idea that of basically of, of human agency, that is to say, when you hear discussions of the economy, it's almost like it's a separate thing like the weather, as opposed to something people create and people structure, right? So the idea of a rigged economy suggests that someone is rigging it, which is very important because it means you could do it differently, right? With climate, I mean, for most of human history, climate was something outside of our control. But we've built such a large technological society that we are now shaping the whole planet and climate in a very negative way that will create, if we don't change our course, a genocide, literally a genocide and a highly unequal one, something like Katrina. Remember in Katrina, the more privileged people, the middle class people, the white people could just move out, and a lot of people of color literally are left behind, right? And we're on top of roofs with fast passing water, and a lot of them actually, uh, actually perished in that. And so imagine that on a world scale. That's what we're talking about with a climate disaster. It's both unequal and it will be a genocide. It will be a die-off of a, of a significant percentage of the human species. And we can absolutely stop it. Uh, Robert Pollan, who's a UW-Madison PhD in economics at University of Massachusetts, has calculated in his Greening of the World Economy, it would take an investment of 1.5% of our GDP to prevent uh, above a 2% increase, which would prevent the worst implications of a climate catastrophe. Okay, So think about that. Think if we were space aliens, right, looking down, would we wonder if this species is intelligent enough to spend 1.5% of its resources? And that would be investments in, 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 in energy, in clean energy, and, in, uh, and also in conservation, right, in order to prevent that kind of disaster. But there's another issue as well, quite frankly, and this is very important in Milwaukee, and that is the economy is not working for people. The level of racial inequality is immense, and what Earl Ingram would have talked about if he was here, and he talks about it on his show all the time, is that Milwaukee had the most prosperous African-American middle class in the country into the late 1970s and early 1980s because folks were drawn during the last part of the Great Migration out of the South, which was a great movement of people away from oppression, by the great manufacturing jobs. And then under Reagan, and the rise of kind of a neoliberal economy, those manufacturing jobs were taken away. 
And we could bring those back if we talk about how we would reinvest to also prevent a climate catastrophe. And so the numbers are just stark. You know, I'll just give you one. There's a famous one that 60% of African American men are not employed. I'm not talking about unemployment, because unemployment only measures people actively looking for jobs, but not employed, right? But if you look at unemployment, right, the African American unemployment rate right now in Wisconsin is 9.3%. The white is 2.6%, okay? So four times higher. And to give you an example of what that means, okay, fundamentally, the uh, white unemployment rate at the height of the Great Recession in 2010, where everyone was feeling a lot of pain, was 7.5%. So the African American unemployment rate now in Wisconsin is two points higher than the, it was the, at its worst for whites in this state. So African Americans are still suffering from the Great Recession. And you wouldn't even know it. All the economic news is about how great the economy is and how things are ticking along and how unemployment is at a record low rate. Now, the other thing to understand here is, is that the primary role now, really, if you look at resources, of local government has become economic development. We spend hundreds of millions in various ways, a lot of it through financing and economic development. Every project you see, every strip mall, every new large building, the city has a role in it, right? There's federal money flowing into it. And virtually none of it is taking into account would it change these horrendous racial economic disparities and what would it do to reduce our, our carbon impact to prevent a climate disaster? It's not even considered, right? And so literally, if you repurposed that money and focused it, because we have the resources or, or made that a factor in every decision we made at, at both factors, carbon and we're talking about in this thing, carbon and climate impact together, right? That you could literally create a just economy because you could rate tens of thousands of new jobs. If you structured it right, you could set it up in a way so those people who were shut out of the economy got, get them. If you don't do that intentionally, they won't get them. Other people will get them. It has to be intentional and part of, the, part of the whole plan. So if you think about it, if you think about how we do policy right now, it's very scattershot and piecemeal. You hear about various initiatives to employ people. You hear about various solar or wind initiatives. Do you ever hear, what do we need to do to actually prevent a climate catastrophe? How would we get a 50% reduction? In, uh, in carbon impact by 2030 and 80% by 2050, which is the Paris climate goals. Do you ever see how, what, how we're doing in Milwaukee or in the state of Wisconsin or nationally and what we would need to do? It's never phrased in terms of the goal. Same with economic inequality. We should be thinking about how we would eliminate it in stages over time by these investments, which means being very intentional. So what's interesting right now, which I think is a huge opening, and I think we, I think a 1,000 organized people could completely transform Milwaukee and make Milwaukee the leader, I think, in, pre in preventing a climate catastrophe and creating a fair economy and reducing and eliminating these racial disparities. The way you would do it, uh, quite frankly, is, is to set a goal. So what's happened, the opening is, is that since Trump so ingloriously pulled out of the Paris Climate Accords and embarrassed us in front of the world, City after city has been passing resolutions saying, we'll meet the Paris Climate Accords. Some have done more than others. Milwaukee passed it, but there's no plan to implement it. So all we are saying is, is that we should do that, and we should develop a plan that would both create a fair economy and dramatically reduce racial inequality, and also, step by step, meet those goals. And we could do that by making massive investments in conservation, which would be about a third of it on average, and two-thirds of renewable energy. And think about renewable energy. Fossil fuels, do we produce those in Milwaukee or in Wisconsin? We're exporting them all. If we had small-scale solar and wind and geothermal, we'd have, we could employ local people to produce that energy, which, of course, produces much more economic impact. And if we do it intentionally, we can create opportunities for all the people shut out of the economy. And let me just close on but we have to do it in terms of knowing what the outcomes we're seeking are exactly and tracking our progress and not falling for feel-good kind of splashy test projects, pilot projects that don't really add up to fixing either one of the problems. We have to be really clear about that. If you're going to build a bridge, right, you literally have to build the whole bridge and figure out what it would cost, what material you need, what's the design, and build it. If you just started, if you didn't do that, if you, if you got a bridge put up, it would fall down. 
right? If you're lucky, you're probably not going to get some, any structure up that's going to work. And here's how bad it is economically. I'll close on this one point. Because I really think a 1,000 organized people could literally dr completely change Milwaukee's economy and our whole approach to the environment. I really do. But you've heard all the good economic news. The Institute for uh, Research on Poverty, which is one of the top poverty research centers in the country, came out with a report that didn't get nearly enough press about two months ago, which found that in this great economy with record low unemployment, poverty went up 10 percent in the last year, and child poverty went up 20 percent. And by the way, African American children, five times more likely to be poor than white children. But what does that say about the structure of the economy? What it means is, quite frankly, that this is the new normal, that if we simply allow this economy to go along without intervention by our democracy, it's going to get worse and worse for the people who need the most opportunity and the most help. We can combine these two things because we have a survival need reason to do it, literally, right? And we also have a, a compelling moral imperative. And there's a lot of hand-wringing about both of these things. What I'd like to see us all do is organize for effective action. And I think city council, county board, these are places that we could very organize very successfully and do this. And there are a lot of potential allies. And a 1,000 people organized is more than enough to be a sea change in, Milwaukee, in local Milwaukee politics. So with that, I want to open with hope that this is in our hands and we can do this. So thank you, everyone. All right, well, Ted and Robert um, did a great job of setting out the task that is before us. Um, and now I'm going to talk about what's been happening in Milwaukee. Um, I have five minutes to tell you about that. And then um, Larry, so I am Linda Frank from 350.org. Larry Hoffman will be joining me to talk about the jobs aspect of the efforts in Milwaukee. Uh, I'm focusing on the um, renewable energy aspect of it. So I, I'm actually excited and impressed with what's going on in Milwaukee right now. Um, I didn't think we'd, be, we'd see this happening so soon. Um, and the way that I got started on this is I had set up a meeting with one of the members of the Common Council who brought in a staff member from the mayor's office and I presented the campaigns for fossil free and 100% renewable energy that are going across the country. Well, uh, the feedback I got was absolutely not feasible in any way right now in Milwaukee. So I left in some discouragement. And to my surprise, a few weeks later, Ted Craig was contacted and, and staff were asked to put together a 100% renewable energy resolution that this common council member is ready and uh, excited to propose. So that is what launched us into the effort of, of starting to write the resolution. And um, well, Ted immediately reached out to Elizabeth Ward from the Sierra Club, who reached out to me from 350.org. So we immediately got this working group of the different organizations um, sharing ideas about what we need in this 100% renewable energy resolution in Milwaukee. Um, so as we uh, worked on it over the past months, uh, we, it became clear that there are certain elements we need in the resolution. And I characterized them as the three S's, support, substance, and stakeholders. So we'll look at the first one right away. Uh, so for support, we have one um, alder person who, is, this is great, he is ready to go with a resolution. Uh, but we realize that we need to get broad support within the Common Council, so we are also contacting and reaching out to other members of the Common Council to try to get their support for this. Um, the Mayor's Office will be important in implementing plans for the clean energy transition, so we're keeping them advised. And community most of all. Our politicians represent us, the people, 
it's important that the people of Milwaukee let them know that we want an end to fossil free pollution. We want um, strong action uh, on the crisis of climate change and we want the benefits of the clean energy transition, the um, climate and economic benefits to go to the entire Milwaukee community and especially those who are disadvantaged. Then substance, uh, it's fairly easy to write a very lovely document and set these goals, but that doesn't get us very far if they don't have something behind them. We need to call for the creation of a concrete plan to achieve those goals, get the money that is going to make it possible to create that plan and to implement it, set deadlines, um, starting with when do we need to achieve this 100% clean energy or renewable energy? Will it be 2035? Will it be 2050? We need to determine those goals and um, plus the interim deadlines and accountability so that um, as the plan progresses, um, those who are responsible for implementing the plan will be reporting to the Common Council and showing the people what progress is being made towards achieving those goals. And then on uh, the stakeholders, well, what we've learned is that the most effective plans come about when there is a meeting of uh, stakeholders from uh, diverse perspectives who get together and identify their interests and concerns, try to uh, come up with a meeting of the minds and draw up recommendations together for the clean en energy plan. Uh, those stakeholders will typically include um, representatives from government, from the electric utility, environmental advocates, uh, jobs leaders, and uh, community members, regulators, academics, it could go on. But all of these diverse groups coming together and having a say in the process. And to wrap up my presentation, what the resolution will include. Uh, there will be a stated goal for 100% clean energy. Um, not only for city operations, that's part of it, but for the community at large, residents, businesses, institutions. Covering all sectors, not only electricity, but heating and transportation. We need to create the clean energy plan. Has to have a strong jobs component, as we've been talking about. We need to identify the funding for it and uh, call for the committee of stakeholders to have their say on developing that plan. And now Larry is going to say something more about the economic opportunities. Uh, I'm Larry Hoffman. I'm a volunteer with Citizen Action. Um, we have dual goals in this project. That is, there are two sides of our coin. Linda talked about the 100% renewable energy side of the coin to fight climate change and its effects. And then there's the jobs side of the coin, and I'll talk about that. In the transition to new renewable energy, 100% of the jobs must pay a living wage, and they must be targeted primarily toward residents of color and also to others who are disadvantaged. Raise your hand if you know the name Fred Royal. Okay, who is he? President of the NAACP of Milwaukee. Can I have that slide? Good, got it. If you've ever listened to Earl Ingram's show on 1510, or some shows on WNOV 860, you may have heard Fred speak. Fred often talks about employment, employment of African Americans, and how, even though there are federal laws, state statutes, city and county ordinances, people of color are still excluded from the jobs that they're capable of doing. Fred Royal 
as president of the Milwaukee branch of the NAACP, knows the institutional history of employment discrimination in Milwaukee. Fred and other African American leaders, such as Frida Webb, who happens to be with us this evening, have been talking with us, and they've told us about some of the major roadblocks that people of color face when they compete with whites for good jobs in the skilled construction trades. Next, please. Good. There are many roadblocks, and I'll just mention two, maybe three. Did you know that the city has a residential preference program? It requires, and it's called the RPP, Residential Preference Program. It requires that a minimum number of local residents must be hired to work on city government contracts. That's a good thing. The bad thing is that it hasn't been adequately enforced. Second example, apprenticeship. Apprenticeship is a path to job skills. Did you know that a majority-owned company, white-owned company, is far less likely than a minority-owned company to train workers of color to be apprentices? So if you've got a majority, white-owned company, they're more likely to train white folks to be apprentices. Third one, did you know that minority-owned companies get hired as subcontractors, like plumbing companies, electrical companies, carpentry companies, but they can't seem to build the financial resources necessary to become actual contractors and make the big money? We've begun to speak with public officials, both white and of color, and we've begun to speak with leaders in the various fields of labor, men and women with expertise in the areas of hiring, training, apprenticeship, and others. We need to find, we need to find and talk with more of them to get their views of what the issues are and to find out how it is that a significant number of white employers fail to take responsibility for racial equity in their companies. I'm no expert in employment or labor relations. Frankly, a white person who has not experienced job discrimination because of their color is unlikely to appreciate the nuances of a discriminatory system as fully as someone who's been in that system. Our coalition needs to connect with Milwaukeeans who can help us understand and help us overcome the details of the dysfunction that results in inequitable employment in our city. So, I've made it my purpose in the citizen action segment of this coalition to try to make the jobs side of the coin achievable by bringing African Americans into the leadership of our coalition. It's easy for white intellectuals like us to gloss over that absence. We need your help your help to find and encourage knowledgeable African Americans who have the time and the drive to join the leadership of this project. And it's not just to have a black face on the committee. It's for genuine participation and an equal voice in our decision-making process. I don't have significant connections with the Latinx community, but we need them too to help, our co help lead our coalition. We seek to we seek your help to identify Latinx who have the understanding, the time, and the energy to work with us. So, building upon what Linda had up here a minute ago, I'll expand her categories. I'll just specify that some of the support for our resolution, she talked about support, has to come from Milwaukee communities, yes, including communities of color. Our stakeholders, community mem they include community members, yes, especially people of color. And our resolution will include a strong jobs component with strong commitment to residents of color. In conclusion, the funding we attract to this project will be for investments that are not only in technology, but also funding to enact systematic practices that will bring our disadvantaged communities on board. We've got to make this a diverse coalition with diverse leadership, 
And that way, we can be wiser. The testimony we give will be more credible. And our goal of 100% living wage jobs will become a reality. My name is Ben Ishibashi, like Ted said. I'm a climate justice organizer with People's Action and People's Action Institute. Uh, we're a national network of community organizations, including Citizen Action of Wisconsin. Um, and uh, I, before I go into kind of how, kind of some other examples of how this has been done, how what we've been talking about has been done in other states, specifically in Illinois, which is where I live, um, and I've been doing some organizing um, for the last couple of years, I want to just kind of ground myself um, and share a bit about why I'm here today. So I'm here today and I'm in this movement, you know, as a climate justice organizer at a national organization um, for a number of reasons, but the most important and the simplest is simply that, like, is simply that as a queer person of color growing up with mental illness in the society, my voice has been stripped from me and the most important decisions about my life have been made for me by people with more money and more power than me time and time again. And when I think about, like, the terror and the despair that I felt over the last half of my life that I've known about climate change, knowing that my house that I grew up um, in next to the water is going to be underwater in the next 20 years, that the places and the people that I love are going to be displaced and destroyed. That is one of the biggest, one of the most violent examples of my voice being silenced and ignored and of my, of my community being shunted to the side in the name of somebody else's profits. So I'm sick of that. And I'm here, and I'm hoping that we're all here today because we want to come together to build power and change that. Does that vibe with other folks? Good. So, and I'm also here today because, and I'm with People's Action, and literally right here with Citizen Action with all the rest of y'all, because I know the approach that we are talking about works. We, I know that when we address economic and racial injustice, when we make those the center of our our climate action platform, that we can achieve things that, are, that would be impossible otherwise. Like, we, could, we cannot win a just transition. We cannot win 100% uh, clean energy anywhere in this country if we are not making racial and economic justice uh, at the uh, racial and economic justice, if we're not leading with racial and economic justice. And I know that we cannot win on racial and economic justice unless we also address climate change. Um, <coughs> And I, I know this from experience. Um, it, starting in 2015, I worked with a number of our affiliate organizations in Illinois and through a coalition called uh, Fair Economy Illinois. There were a number of groups in it that I won't go through the list. Um, that was itself you know, part of other, a series of other coalitions informally called the Illinois Climate Table. Um, and by building a statewide coalition that was in large part led by working class people and by people of color from all the way down from near East St. Louis all the way up to the north suburbs of Chicago, we were, and by, uh, we were able to reframe what climate change and what clean energy were about in our state and win one of the most ambitious uh, climate bills our state has ever seen, which is the Future Energy Shops Act, which is what I'm going to talk about today and give folks a sense of what is possible when we tackle these two, these two major crises, these, two these, two systems of, uh, these multiple systems of oppression together. Um, oh, 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 okay. Um, so at the very most basic level, um, the Illinois Future Energy Jobs Act puts Illinois on track to achieve 25 percent renewables, uh, renewable energy by 2025. That had been a goal that had been set back in 2008, but due to a number of reasons, progress just wasn't happening. Um, this bill has fixed that. Um, and it also, less excitingly, um, was also able to win some modest but still really real improvements in the standards um, for energy efficiency that the two biggest corporate utilities were held to. Um, and so while those percentages on energy efficiency do are fairly small, and, but it's also important to note that they are going to save um, the Illinois consumers taken together over $4 billion over the next 10 years in terms of reduced energy bills, which means more money in the pockets, especially of low-income people and of poor people who are most burdened by high utility bills. Um, to give you a further sense of scale, it also required um, over 4,300 megawatts of new in-state wind and solar generation. So this is a new generation that has to be built in Illinois by 2030. Um, so to give you a sense of how big of a shift that is, that increases the amount of wind uh, power that's going to be built in our state by over 33% in 10 years, and increases the amount of solar power that we're going to be generating in the next 12 years by over 5,000%. So that is 
big. Um, so how are we able to do that? Um, is a question I've been asked since, um, since, I, since we won this. And there's a lot that goes into that, but I think one of the main areas that we were able, one of the way, main ways we were able to build power and build a big enough we to win on this, to build enough coalition to win on this, that had traction in, uh, in downstate rural communities where climate change is a dirty word to the south side and the west side of Chicago, is by, make, is by putting, in large part, jobs at the center. Um, so we made, through a variety of programs, we were able to make sure that, um, in part also through the scale of the energy that we're creating, that this bill between 2020 and 2030, when it really starts to kick in, we'll be creating about 32,000 direct jobs a year, which is a lot. Um, it's about 50% of all of the existing clean energy jobs in the state. Um, and then we also made sure that anyone receiving incentives, especially folks who are receiving incentives to do some of the other programs um, that I'm going to talk to about on my uh, next slide, that, they are, that they're hiring folks from low-income communities, that they're providing training opportunities to folks from low-income communities, um, and especially also environmental justice communities, which are overwhelmingly like 99% communities of color in our state for a bunch of um, BS constitutional reasons. We couldn't actually say the words minority or community of color in the bill, but we found some workarounds. Um, and another one of which was that at least half of all the thousands of uh, job training program slots that have been created have to go to people from identified low income communities and environmental justice communities that are in the front lines of dirty energy pollution. Um, and in addition to this, uh, we, we were also actually able to create a, for the big utilities, create a um, specific job target, creation target of 2,000 jobs for formerly incarcerated people and people coming out of our uh, foster care system. So two populations, again, overwhelmingly folks of color, overwhelmingly folks who are left out um, and in many ways intentionally excluded from our economy. Um, so by really focusing um, our, you know, our push for clean energy around things other than just like the percentages of, of solar we were going to build or the new wind turbines we were going to build, which excited some people, but by really talking about jobs and how this would actually meet people's direct economic needs in the here and now, especially in the parts of our state that are struggling, we were able to build us so much more power. And because of that, um, and because those folks were really stepping out and taking leadership in terms of demanding what kinds of jobs and what kinds of energy programs we were demanding, we were able to win much, a much more equitable climate bill than we had any dreams of winning initially. So we were able to win three quarters of a billion dollars in targeted energy efficiency, renewable energy, and jobs training programs that are just for um, low-income communities, economically disadvantaged communities, and environmental justice communities. Um, so again, in the, about over the vast majority of that money is going to end up in communities of color. Um, and this program includes the Illinois Solar for All program, which a number of our leaders, from, um, especially from a number of groups, um, the folks who were organized through churches in Peoria, Illinois, which at the time that we were organizing this, uh, around this, was literally the worst uh, city in the country, economically, for black people to live in. Um, so they had a very direct stake in terms of, 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 what, of the vision that they had. Um, the Illinois Solar for All program dedicates uh, nearly $300 million uh, over the next 10 years to expanding uh, basically community-owned, collectively and community-owned low-income uh, solar projects that give poor folks, folks in um, communities that, where energy poverty <coughs> is rampant and folks who have been living in the wake of uh, the polluting power plants, um, actual ownership of the, ener of the new energy system that we are building and that much more control and power in the new energy economy that we're building so that we're not just building an energy economy where the same wealthy people who have been owning the dirty energy economy still hold all the reins. Um, and then we were also able to cap increases on, in uh, people's electricity bills so that, not, so that all these really ambitious programs are ultimately paid by those who are responsible for the crisis, which are, are the shareholders of our big utilities and not ordinary people and poor people. Um, and that is my last slide. Um, so that is just a snapshot of what is possible when we take the demands of just when we make our demands for racial and economic justice and our demands for a livable climate, a livable climate, when we make those demands, when we weave them together and make them one, um, I'm going to hand it off to actually Miranda from the Sierra Club to talk more about how we can do that here in Milwaukee. I want to introduce myself. My name is Miranda Ehrlich, and I am a community organizer for the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Oak Creek coal plants? Heard of those? Now, how many of you have heard about some of the issues surrounding those coal plants, especially in the last year? Yeah, so there's some pretty nasty 
stuff going on um, that's really impacting the neighbors of those coal plants, particularly with coal dust. Um, and I think it really is just, uh, for me as someone who's working with that community um, every day, it's really a reminder that um, this the electricity we use when we turn on the lights here, that has consequences for real people, for real families. And every day that we're continuing to be reliant on fossil fuels uh, is a day where there are communities that are suffering. And so I feel like that's just a reminder that that really is hitting home and it's hitting home closer than we might think. Um, how, what percent do you think of our energy here in the We Energies territory comes from coal? Do people think? 50%. Right on the money, yes, it's about 50%. Um, an additional about 30% is gas, which adds up to about 80% uh, fossil fuels, and less than 3% of that is renewable, or less than 3% of the total is renewable energy. So, with that, that's where we are. I'm delighted to be here with you guys here tonight to um, share some of what. Reamp has been thinking about this. So just as a kind of tiny bit of Reamp TED background, Ted talked about this slightly. So Reamp is an is a network of nonprofits and foundations across eight Midwest states. And we came together in 2004 because that was a moment where where across the Midwest utilities were rushing to build new coal power plants. And Environmentalists in a number of states were like, law, we don't think that's where we want to go in the future. And so we came together to really think about how to strategically fight this. And sort of our, one of our mantras at REAMP is that we think systemically and act collaboratively. This is actually a mind map from back in 2004 when folks were first, okay, we don't want all this new coal power in the Midwest. How, how do we come together to to address that, and really at that point we identified four strategies, increase energy efficiency, increase clean energy, so those two things mitigate the need for coal plants, stop the new dirty coal, and close existing dirty coal plants. So from 2004 to 2017 we saw a lot of success with this, but as we moved through this there was recognition that we weren't paying enough attention as a network to equity issues, that transportation wasn't a big enough piece of what was on our radar because that was a kind of a growing piece of where emissions were coming from. So in the last year, we've sort of developed a new mantra, and it's around equitable deep decarbonization. And, and essentially, it's threefold. Include everyone, electrify everything, and decarbonize electricity. And I'm gonna just take you through what each of those things mean a little bit, because I think as you're thinking about this in Milwaukee, it's just a useful kind of framework sort of piece. Um, so include everyone. Um, several speakers, starting with um, folks at the beginning, talked about this, Ben certainly alluded to it in the Illinois. The, the reality is, historically, the benefits of clean energy have not been evenly distributed in our communities. The folks who can afford to take advantage of typical energy efficiency programs usually have a couple of resources. They have time to learn about the programs, to like go online and learn about technologies. They have capital to pay for improvements up front. You know, there's just a lot of ways that systemically we've, we've disadvantaged some communities over others. But it's even more than just who gets to participate in programs. Um, this is a recent study from the University of Minnesota, just looking at how the difference in air quality in different communities affects our lives. We're, we're at a point, and I remember when someone first said this at a talk I was at, and it still stuns me to think about this, that, that one of the best predictors of your life expectancy is your zip code. And so as a network, REAMP is really thinking about, okay, so, so how do we make sure everyone's at the table and everyone's interests are, are part of what's going on? Um, we organize ourselves regionally, but we also have state tables. Ben alluded to this, that the Illinois state table of REAMP members was very involved in the efforts to get 
the, the bill passed in Illinois. You know, we've a Wisconsin table, and in Wisconsin we're always talking about how do we make sure everyone's voice is at our table because we want to include everyone. We're not aiming to create a cleaner, less carbon toxic future on behalf of folks. We want everyone involved in that process. So include everyone is really fundamental to this. The second piece is to electrify every, everything. And I want to kind of give you a sense of how we think about that. So in my little graph, this is a pie chart of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions in 2016. And the electric piece is green here because we can make that piece green. We can get our electricity from wind and solar and hydro and not have emissions. The other pieces, though, the transportation that comes from jet fuel and gasoline and the things that come from natural gas are much more difficult to make clean with those fuels. <laughs> it's much easier to electrify those pieces. So when we think about this and, you know, building our framework, we worked with regional and national experts on how to do this. You know, electrify everything for us has three parts. It's about electrifying transportation and then buildings, but it's also energy efficiency, and that's really important because what we do with energy efficiency is we shrink the whole size of this pie. When we reduce demand, we make that pie smaller. And fundamentally, that's the easiest way for us to make progress on these goals is to start with the increasing energy efficiency. And, you know, we're talking about doing that across everything. Um, I've been involved in energy efficiency in Wisconsin for something like 25 years. It's, it's kind of frightening for me to do the math. But I increasingly think that we shouldn't talk about energy efficiency. We should talk about waste. We should just talk about it as wasted energy. Why is it that you're spending three times as much electricity to cool your beer as me? That seems silly. We both end up with a bottle of beer that's cold, but you use tw three times as many kilowatt hours to get there as I did. That's not a very good Midwest value. That's <laughs> nonsensical. But to, and to, So part of what we need for energy efficiency, though, is you need a way to know how much energy am I using to power my house? You need to know how you compare to others. So really important here, it's a place where the utility comes in, is some benchmarking information. Who has a sense of how their energy use at home compares to other homes in Wisconsin? Show of hands. Yep, it's pretty hard to figure out. Afterwards, I'm glad to help you figure it out, but it's hard to figure out. There are a couple of big benefits that come from increasing energy efficiency. The first, of course, is that you save money. Your bill goes down. The bills of public facilities go down. Schools can spend money on teachers and books instead of electricity. The other big benefit here is this jobs benefit. Okay, energy efficiency is something that we can't outsource. <clears throat> Retrofits aren't going to happen in... China. They're going to happen in the buildings in our community. So there's, there's enormous opportunity here. And of course, just as everyone's been talking about, we've got to make sure that, that those jobs are, are available to everyone in our community. So that's the increasing energy efficiency piece. Then there's electrifying buildings. And this is a mind shift for us in the Midwest. Because probably we all forever have thought it's better to have a gas-heated building than, a, than an electric-heated building. But we're shifting into new technologies, and we're talking about high-efficiency heat pumps and technologies that are going to make it cheaper to heat your home with electricity in the future. But that's a big transition. Again, here, we have the potential to save money, and we have the potential to create jobs. The last piece of electrification is about transportation. And really, when we think about electrifying transportation, we want to first think about shrinking how much we're using vehicles to move us around, particularly by ourselves. You know, so we want to think about public transit and biking and walking, as well as the transition from... So in the, in the industry, we're calling traditional fuel vehicles ICE, internal combustion engine 
you'll start to see that, that, that those of us who live in an EV world talk about ice, you know, and getting rid of another getting rid of ice thing. Huh. Um, here you've got a couple of advantages. The first is a health advantage. So as we remove vehicles from our street that spew emissions right there on the corner where our kids are crossing the street. The one that always makes me crazy is people idling in front of a school to pick up children. It's like, can I just hand out gas masks to those kids before they walk out? But we also get health benefits from people taking public transit and biking and walking. People who take the bus are statistically more healthy than people who drive themselves. Multiple studies. So we have that. And we also, of course, have savings. Operating an electric vehicle is substantially lower cost over time than an ICE. First, it has far fewer moving parts, so there's almost no maintenance, but fuel costs are also less than half as much. So you get all of these benefits. So we're, as we, though, electrify everything, there's an important equity piece of this to think about. So we're transitioning from a place where electricity was really important in our lives to one where it's fundamental and it's, it's part of how we get around in addition to how we live. And that means we need to think about how we frame access to electricity. The NAACP is doing really important work talking about how we need to think about electricity as a human right in the same way we think about access to clean water as a basic human right. Um, I pulled a couple of statistics just to give you a little bit of a flavor for, so, so in Wisconsin, you, we have a winter shutoff law. Utilities can't disconnect customers in the winter. And on April 15th, people who are behind in their bills risk disconnection. Last year, which was the last time I could find data, We Energies um, said they were disconnecting between four and 5,000 people on April 15th. But, oops, wrong. Button. But in 2008, at the height of the recession, they disconnected 60,000 people. That's 60,000, and that's not people, that's 60,000 households. That's households without. So as we think about equity, we, we have to think about all of the ways that this affects communities. Um, electrification is our path forward, but we've really got to think about how we make sure that everyone's protected in that model. The last piece of this, of course, is decarbonizing electricity. And Miranda and others have, have talked about this a little bit. I have a, I have a graph for you. So this is um, Wisconsin, not Milwaukee, but Wisconsin's um, electricity generation in April. And here, coal was... 50%, gas is about 20% here, nuclear is about 20 and then the hydro and renewables. So we have a long way to go. And in reality, as Miranda said, Wisconsin is getting further and further behind all the time. You know, when I started in energy efficiency 25 years ago, there were three states in the country that everyone looked to for leadership. Like every time something happened, people noticed, and that was California, New York, and Wisconsin. Today, the national entities like the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, who rate states, put us at like 22 or 24 in terms of the 1 through 50. We're mediocre at best. I'm so excited about what Illinois is doing, but at the same time, when I started in this field, we talked about how much better we were than Illinois because we planned and we were doing efficiency. And I used to have a whole spiel that I gave about how lucky businesses were to be in Wisconsin, not Illinois. And now I listen to Ben and go, if only. So there's a challenge there. At the same time, there's a lot going in our favor. So this is kind of a busy slide. Let me, this is, and this is utility scale efforts. So this green bar here is how much it costs utilities to build a natural gas power plant. And since 2010, those costs have been relatively flat. Utilities measure these costs in megawatt hours. So about $60 a megawatt hour is what it took 
to build a natural gas plant. In 2010, that's still pretty much the price in 2018. These blue dots are the actual costs of utility scale solar projects. So back in, you know, 2013 even, the typical project was twice as expensive solar project was twice as expensive as a natural gas plant. Today, the solar projects are consistently cheaper than the natural gas projects. And there's no ongoing fuel costs, because the sun is pretty much there every day. That's a good question. On that. Does that include environmental costs? No. This is straight up. No, because they, they aren't monetized. It doesn't factor in operational costs. Like it, it, factors in a little bit of operational cost, but not Those perpetual. Yeah, but right, right. But this is yeah. But, but this is include. this this does not. This is just straight up construction costs. So so what this tells us is even though and a similar thing is true for for community scale solar or individual scale solar. You know that the. the Costs are changing in dramatic ways that make it more and more feasible for these projects to be happening. So even though we've got a long way to go, we're, we're really convinced that this can happen. And when you decarbonize electricity, you not only create local jobs, you save money and you improve health. So it becomes a triple whammy there, which is why we're so excited about equitable deep decarbonization at REAMP. And that's it for me. What we're going to be doing over the next 30 minutes is we're going to be asking folks about basically your vision of how, you know, taking everything that you've been taking in so far today, everything that you've been learning, you know, before here, when you came, before coming here, like what, like what is your vision of a 100% renewable and 100% just with good jobs Milwaukee look like? Um, and the reason that we want to do this is I think kind of circling back to something that Ted said at the very beginning is we know that it's not enough for, you know, a group of like 10 or 20 folks, you know, to sit in a room, you know, whatever their intentions, whatever their values, whatever even their, their smarts, um, to come together and create policy. We know that at the end of the day, if we are trying to create the big systemic change that we need to do, that we need to, that we need to make in order to right the injustices that we are, we are living through and to actually be able to survive um, as a community, that we need, we can't just be handing down decisions, however, or policies that we come up with. That we actually need to be going out to our neighbors, especially to the folks who are most impacted, um, and and inviting folks in, and inviting in a broader conversation, a bigger conversation that builds the bigger, the bigger, the, a bigger and bigger we that is able to overcome the power of the fossil fuel industry and the one percent that is trying to maintain the status quo. Um, so Miranda is going to kick us off with. Yeah, absolutely. The first part of that. Yeah, so we're gonna what we're gonna do is have two questions that we discuss, and we're gonna break into smaller groups. We're actually gonna do uh, a six-minute discussion in pairs of this first question. Then we'll come back. We'll do a, a bigger group discussion and kind of write down some of the stuff we've thought about. How do we actually what what at the end point when we have 100% renewable energy? What does that actually actually look like? What does that how do we build that policy so it really does address systemic racism and doesn't just provide more jobs to people who are already mm -hmm. privileged and already benefiting, right? So how do we actually put that into reality? How do we take this vision and make it concrete? I will write that question up on this paper. You have six minutes. Find a friend or two and get your thoughts down. Yes. Ways to store it. Oh, sure. But you have to, I mean, efficiency comes from smart transmission lines, storage facilities where you can actually send the power to be stored when you have an excess amount that's not wasted and then bring it back. So, water utilities, electrical utilities, water utilities, like, like I said, 15 to 20 percent is an acceptable waste rate. Electrical, it's about the same. I don't remember. It's gotten better, but we have no place in America where you that's efficient like the Europeans with smart transmission lines. That's a start. That's, that's a place a huge to go. And then, if you look at our inner cities, to bring in the racial component or just the inner city component, most of our aging infrastructure is in the cities. That needs to change. So most of your old power transformers, power utilities, all that's in the inner city. Those have to be changed. 
it's difficult, but it's difficult to work in the city because when you tear up streets and tear down, whenever you're doing something, you're going to disrupt the economy of that community, depending on the scale of your of your project. So it's a difficult thing. And a lot of jobs. It can be, but it might cost you. I mean, it's a balance. If you shut right. down a store or a, like they just got high 100 all tore up down in Hales Corners in Franklin. And there's several businesses are hurt when they tore up I-94. In the zoo interchange, I can't. It's it's millions of dollars it's costing in transportation and truck rerouting. It's that kind of stuff that has, has to happen with infrastructure. It's a di it's not easy. I used to work for the sewage district, so we used to do these huge projects. We always had to take into consideration what we were going to impact the local businesses by tearing up the streets to fix aging pipes. It's a it, it has to be done in stages, and it's that sometimes leads to inefficiencies. So it's built into the system. How do you change that? I don't know. Pay the businesses who are going to be impacted. But. So it's a natural thing for them to have a good time to be with them. Right. So, in other parts of the, of the country, just go keep talking. <laughs> in other parts of the country where people are employed already but would like to do it to their house, mm -hmm. you'll have a trained workforce coming in that was formerly un unemployed, but they can then help build that. Right. New house. So it it works nicely across. You continue to build outward. Right. So but build start local. Within, right wherever you see people standing around, say what what property does the city own or somebody that we can yeah. basically take command of and transform this into an energy efficient building. And we're going to do it with whatever with, with with the collective energy right here. We're going to have somebody who's knowledgeable about what is necessary and what's needed to lead the way. Naturally, we know we're going to have some personal issues, but we're going to we're committed to overcoming all that, and that will build that will build confidence, and that confidence will transform into expertise. So let me just be the devil's advocate here. How are you going to get the money for the equipment? And that, that's the, the issue. Okay. That's the issue. Okay. Uh, so someone. It has to be determined that it is. This is worth. There's an investment in two ways. There's a human investment, and there's a real estate investment. Okay, so we we need somebody to see it, because as you say, as as this happens, it saves money. As it doesn't happen, we're we're just uh, throwing good money after bad, so to speak. Okay, right, right. we got a lot of energy efficient, un inefficient properties and houses, and we got people being indebted to we energies. Okay. And we got people unemployed, okay? Right, right. So this transitions that. Yeah. So it's not probably an immediate re a return on investment, but it's a longer return on the, it's a, it. It is a return on investment. Okay. As you say, uh, people who walk to work are healthier. And yes. if, you, if there's a, you know, this is going on in a neighborhood, so they, they have access to it. They don't have to have a car to get there. Right. It's not Foxcom. It's, and, and basically it's, uh, you could basically provide housing for the homeless, and so you keep transitioning. Okay. And you can, you know, uh, provide, uh, reduce the uh, utility bills for any um, low-income people, and that right, that right. savings will produce an, an enormous amount of other things. Right. But the Illinois project had a lot of money coming in from the government. So, so yeah, that's where you start. That's right. The government has to invest. Right. Someone has to seed it, okay? So what's the cost here? What's the what's the material cost? Uh, who are the experts here? Um, and, and it was interesting uh, working on the park at, at Miller Park. I was say on time on budget. Well, we know we're not rushing this. This is to be done uh, at the rate at the, that the students can go because we, we're perfecting we're perfecting the building and we're perfecting people, okay? So we're going to use this all as a teaching project. But as you say. Where do we get the money, and how much money are we talking about? And uh, the longer we do it, the more efficient we become, the lo less time it takes, and then we can move on to the next thing. But you also look at it as it's not just a project to help a person. It's a project to develop the whole energy industry. Right. 
and it has that benefit of, of climate it change. It goes from a, a, a micro to a macro. But you sell the government on the macro. Having, well, it's, yes, but helping people the, also. Right, that's and, right. And working on the unemployment You're transitioning project. people from on the tax rolls, not being taxpayers, to becoming taxpayers. Right, exactly. And so that investment is paying off. It's a win-win. Okay, we solved that. <laughs> <laughs> All we need is some money. Train cars. Remember that? Yes, yes. That Scott Walker's. That would have been built right here on the north side of Milwaukee. And lots of jobs. Lots of jobs. And the new industries that are moving down into Racine could have been located in lots of places in Milwaukee instead of on farmland. So, you know, we could have, we could have when we start thinking talk, you know, about the jobs coming here, we'll be up that much further ahead. We need to. And that's a decision that, you know, we don't have. There's a lot, you know, there are small groups going around that are getting people trained. Um, there's small nonprofits that are working with trained people. And I think if more funding can go to those people who are on the ground, in neighborhoods, training people, that's where we can have it. Instead of depending on the large systems to do it. Because they're not going to do it. So it talks about what would it look like if we had 100% renewable energy. And I think that it would look beautiful if we had 100% of renewable energy in Milwaukee. Um, and we will have less health issues. Yes. Um, we will have people actually uh, working and having their living expenses decrease so they will have more time and more money to do other things <coughs> instead of working themselves to death and then their kids being left at home to raise themselves. Yeah. Less um, resources that have to go to social services yep. and to the health department, health department to uh, the, uh, the police department. You know. Everybody wouldn't have to have their own. do that. Uh, many other, uh, you know, uh, entities could do that. And then companies could form there and they could hire people there. Because if you, if you build the plant in Waukesha, these people aren't going to get out there. So I think that's really important. And then you had the idea of the percentage, right? Right. I'm modeling after the Illinois that certain thousands of jobs were going to communities that were economically disadvantaged. And then you yeah. had the, um, the one in China. In China, every building has to have some form of solar. All new buildings have to have solar. Uh, we say if we go into the community and we adopt, we adopt, take over a build, identify a building that we could do right in the community and we'd hire anybody that was sitting on a stoop in that community, we'd build a team spirit within that and we'd work with that group with the expertise to take that building to where we needed to go for whatever time it takes to basically show people what they can do to transform their communities. Just, just a couple things that we 
can talk about um, one, the infrastructure of the usually in lower income areas of Milwaukee, the infrastructure is in bad shape. Two, the percentages, if you set up percentages for contracting, you're going to, it doesn't work as efficiently as people think. The big contractors will hire trucking firms with minority presidents, but no minority staff that works for them. They know how to do that game. So I really am a, don't think that percentages work. What you really need is you go to the contractors and you go to the trade unions. And when you're going to be doing these solar things, but actually rebuilding the infrastructure, building smart transmission lines, building storage areas, so when you create electricity, you can store it when you don't use it. Those things could be done in some of the inner city areas, as well as you hire, uh, get trade unions and the contractors to work with training facilities that provide trained workers that already have some of the licenses that they can start as a journeyman. Because if you just train them to build a house, that's great. But that's a short-term fix. They do that. They're not going to get hired by a contractor because they may not have all the licensing and training they need. But if you set up a training through some of the facilities, and there's, there's WRTP, Big Step in Wisconsin, and 16th Street Community Center, Esperanza, Unita, all those groups, we worked with them when we were doing contracting, and they will provide trained workers. And they need support to do that. That's what I think would be the work. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, different angle from the jobs, and people know me, I bring this up in terms of, 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 of what the future means in terms of the mass of people, as opposed to those of us who may be able to afford solar on our roofs and, and electric cars. And the, the example that was brought up earlier about, about uh, community co co cooperative solar, such as in Middleton, Wisconsin, where Ritter can buy into a solar array and get the benefit of that. In the same way as we talk about transportation, we've had some discussions over the last couple of days in terms of public transportation and what's clean. It comes down to it's got to be electric. And for the masses of people, at the same time as we talk about other institutions or systems, you know, so, so transportation, solar, getting it out to the masses. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes, sir. I have uh, pretty much common knowledge that this state incarcerates more people per capita than any other state in the country. That's a huge resource that's being wasted. Uh, I think you would be a really good program, we could set up an education program within our prison system to teach people how to build wind turbines, uh, how to construct solar panels, battery storage, all these kind of things. This would be a wonderful thing. That, so when people are returning citizens, they could be matched up with companies. Uh, and, and we have to build this infrastructure somewhere, and that would be a good place to use this resource of returning citizens. Yeah, and, and I know the, the prison system, they do have programs to help get get those in prison and start attending school now, so there's no reason why that can't happen. Right. And so everything I've added, I thought about a lot of those things. The other thing, too, is you know they, how they redid West Lawn Project. You know, well, what about when we do these, uh, go into these projects that are based for low-income homes, we get the funding to make them with uh, solar, with the solar panels, and make sure the people that are doing the jobs to put the solar panels on there are people from the communities, and so that it's a win for the community as a, an entire whole. Excellent. Great example. Yes. Yeah, you know, those are often big questions to sort of try to just pick in six minutes. Um, so what, one thing might be, like, where are uh, groups of my, or minority organizations uh, involved now in something related to these kinds of issues, right? It's, you know, it's not a lot probably in solar development right at the time, but there is a lot in sort of healthy, in the sort of healthy food, uh, which really wasn't talked about before the big, um, energy user as well, particularly since we get our food from all over the world now, particularly from Mexico and Southern California. Um, so uh, um, there are a fair number of uh, minority groups, you know, and they involve a lot of youth sometimes, that are doing all kinds of sort of uh, uh, 
uh, sustainable kind of uh, gardening and all that sort of stuff. Those are groups we should be bringing into the coalition and um, being part of this. Um, we thought that um, the whole lead pipe issue in Milwaukee was very important and that while we're, I, I really appreciated the woman in the back who spoke about picking out some homes in, in a neighborhood where uh, you have unemployed people and you have people of color and you have returning felons, but while you're doing of the um, electrification or putting on solar, solar panels, that's going to take a lot of construction to have the people themselves be trained to do it, but also deal with the lead pipe issue because, you know, we have cleaner uh, energy and we're poisoning people mm -hmm. through the lead pipes. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the point? Mm -hmm. Very true. Great points. Okay, well, this is excellent. I apologize. We don't have any more time for this segment, but now um, Ben's going to talk, talk you all into the next question. Um, so for, in our, for our second question, which I have written out, I want to kind of push folks to think a little more deeply. We've been talking about the what. I want to kind of put in the second question, we're going to be talking about the how. So, you know, as we're going into this campaign, as we're launching this project to get, you know, to get us, get Milwaukee to 100%, um, how do we make sure that the process we're putting forward, the process that we're demanding and fighting for from the city, from the county, from, um, you know, from our, our representatives, how are we making sure that that process uh, to decide the pathway that gets us to 100% fully includes and uplifts the voices of communities of color, and then I'd also add, and for people in Milwaukee. So the question here is, what is the process for which this actually gets implemented, right? So we can't answer all those questions today. That's going to take a lot of committees, a lot of smart people. But how do we ensure that that process we put into place through this resolution is one that includes all voices when we're trying to decide, okay, we need this many of this kind. Here's where we're going to put it. So at that, with that, I think we should turn it over to the groups. Yeah. <laughs> and we have to be non-traditional as well as traditional. Yeah. We have to be non-traditional. Yeah. We have to be non-traditional. Yeah. 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 Do you know? Uh, well, there's a there's a large solar panel industry, uh -huh. and they want to put up houses you know, with solar panels. But that you can get a certain amount of your energy from the house, and so and that's a very good method. But getting. Um, I can see how we do it on houses, but you need a huge solar array to produce enough electricity to run all the buses and all the cars in the city. So that's going to have to done. You don't do that in, in the city, you do it outside the city. So you've got to find some way to get people if you're doing that. You know, a lot of uh, well, that's why I, I would first I would first do a project in the neighborhood. Yeah. Once right. I do a, pro I'm seeking to build interest and expertise. Right. Okay. And once right. I build interest and expertise, and people see the value, then they'll make, then they'll discipline themselves to help go to the next step, whatever those next steps are, and and then they'll be interested in finding who are the experts. Everybody who knows something wants to know who's the smartest. And so you want to basically, as they say, go out there with the big ships and when you play basketball with the best, when you play football with the best, you want to know who's the best in this in this, in, right. this industry. And so as you transition from a small project to larger projects and see the bigger picture, then you want then you see the steps to be made. And so you'll do that by traditional, normal classroom and then non-traditional, which is basically hands-on. When people may not be fluent readers, 
they may be very good at hands-on, and then once they do the hands-on, they'll uh, they'll get a, an appreciation for the written work. So you got to go do the traditional and the non-traditional. And then, as you say, those larger projects that are basically done outside of urban areas, then they'll have the motivation and, and the, uh, the relationships to get to there, wherever those are. But um, I, w I would see something like building a solar array, and it's, it's not easy to find places for this. But building solar arrays, you have to go outside the city. You don't, you're not going to put a solar array over every football, soccer, and baseball field. Uh -huh. And the park. So you have to go somewhere else. But then you could, once you start that, you could be running your buses off of the energy in that solar array to bring people out. Okay. So they would have. But, the, but that's not really addressing the question. No, it is. How do you fully include everyone? We got to we gotta introduce them. People, we are introducing them. And you got you got a residential, you got a commercial, then you got transportation, and then you can introduce people to cars and whatever uh, electric cars do and how they do it, and whatever it takes and where the best places are to basically uh, engineer and process whatever it takes to make that happen. But you got to introduce them, you got to get their attention, and you got to make them believe that there's a role here for them. And then the whatever the technical skill, academic skill sets are, that you help them develop those as well. So they, wherever it is to move to the next place, they move to the next place. But once you once you start teaching people how to do this, they become the experts. That's right. They become the experts. And they teach they, you. Yeah. And they. So you're going to have an expertise in the inner city that the rest of the place doesn't have. Right. Because once you bring new blood in, got new ideas. Right. And it's amazing what people don't know what they don't know when they start applying themselves that they do know. But if you have, if you really convince the city, the state, mm -hmm. to go into this and do 100 percent. You've got to go in all these different directions. Right. And once you get people understanding how a solar array works, if it's on your roof mm -hmm. or out in a out in the country somewhere, or on the roof of another of the every city built every um, business is building, mm -hmm. uh, a good place to put them is in parking lots. Because you just put it up over the top of the cars and you see this. We so have some of that. Conducting the sunlight, transferring it into solar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you build an array of solar panels mm -hmm. up above the parking and you get your parking lot covered with solar panels and it's still a parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, there are things like that. Um, but once you can put it on a house, you'll be able to put it on a parking lot. And you have that expertise built up in the inner city, they'd be the ones to go to first to get there, right. because they'd be out there. So we, we do a project right in the neighborhood. We don't, all you have to do is be willing to work. I won't, I won't cross you off by no academics, no whatever, and show up and be part of this team to make it happen. And then you can keep going. Wherever. I don't Those other conversations? Stara, little and me. All right, so what were some things that came up around how we make an inclusive and just process around decision making in this whole transition? What were some things that came up in folks' groups? Let's see a hand over there. Um, I think something very important is about developing relationships with communities of color. Yes. There are a few of us here from Common Ground and um, our organizers have spent a lot of time w developing relationships with people of color so that we can really work together on issues that are important to everyone. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's a lot different when you're talking about someone than when you're talking about something we other folks. Yes. So I see developing relationships in terms of inviting everybody to the table from the very beginning. Everybody and keeping going back and getting them to come if they didn't come the first, second, or third time. Yes. That way it's a broad community base. Yes. Yes. Oh, right. yes. Thanks. Yeah. Other hands. Yes, it must be a community project that basically doesn't exclude anyone. If you show up, we'll work with you. Yes. And we'll take you to the next level, whatever that next level is with you. As long as you show up and work with us, we'll work with you. So I can there, and then there, and then any other hands over here. And 
one of the last one about the next, then we're going to wrap up. Um, I, I see one of the ways of developing relationships with people as um, helping them to address the lead problems that we have in the city, whether it's lead and water, the lead paint issue, there's lead all over. And if we can help them solve some of those problems, like give them water filters, that'll help establish a relationship. Um, also, another point that we talked about is the importance of education. Um. Yeah, just a, a follow-up to that first one, developing relationships with communities of color. There are so many organizations in the African-American community that getting, the, getting them involved to go into the community to um, um, touch base with, you know, with a lot of people, and also even the Spanish community, like... Um, Help me. <laughs> Voice of Steel of Fuente. Yeah. You know, inviting them to this meetings like this and um, getting them involved and then having them contact. They, they would know who to contact, you know, and how, how to touch base with people and get them involved. Yeah. Uh, so just like you, sir, and then you, sir, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. Sorry. I guess that you're deferring. <laughs> Elected officials have a lot of uh, contacts and tentacles and feelers in the community, and many of them, I think, uh, particularly the Common Council, would be receptive uh, to some of these ideas, and they will be able to communicate with their constituents and bodies and so on. So, not just the Common Council, but also the, the, the county board and other levels of elected officials. Uh, are w another way of talking and working with folks. Yeah, uh, yeah and, then, and then we're not going to cut it off, and then, and then, and then we're going to cut it off. So I mean, at some level, what we, we need to get to this kind of capacity we're talking about is to have some funding to have some, and organi some organizers, right? So this is kind of what they do, right? And volunteers will do a little pieces here and there, but unless we have full-time paid organizers, particularly some organizers who are from minority there. Yeah. All right, last comment. Um, I was just looking at this broader picture that I suggested before. In our first one, we said train people in the inner city by doing a single house. And when the locals find that to be very worthwhile because they're not getting their electricity cut off at the end of the winter, that the solar panels are actually working for them, the people around them will start wanting to do it also. And this, you're in a, in a situation where there are a lot of unemployed people. We said that at the start. And those people can train. If you go into a general community and you try to train someone, they've already got a job, they don't want to stop training for a job, you have this population. And they will become the experts in installation. So when you need to go to a to a large company and put up these panels in their parking lot up above the parking for the cars, these are the people that will come out of the inner city and have a job waiting for them. These are the people, when you talk about a deal decarbonizing the electrical grid so that you can have buses and trucks and everything running off, you've got to have large arrays somewhere else uh, to work on and you'll have a workforce coming out of the inner city that has better training than anyone outside the inner city. Yeah, so making sure that folks who are currently most left out have the best access to training. Definitely. And then, since yeah. Yeah, like ten seconds. Um, I feel compelled as a white person to learn to make space to take leadership from people of color. And I yes. think as a whole movement, like how do we actually do the internal work? Um, to really make the space and then to learn how to truly take leadership, not just invite to the table, but to expect that people of color are going to lead the conversation. Definitely. And so, sorry, you know, I just have a short question. Is it five seconds? Yes. All right. Uh, where does the money come from for all this? That is another part of this broader conversation that we are just starting, very much starting today. I think. I think it's also an open question. I was just going to say I think the polluters should pay. That's just my opinion, and that is another round of this conversation that needs to happen and that we need to be having with more people. What was your opinion? I think the, the polluters should be made to pay. We should take the money they've been making off of poisoning us and use it 
to find a lot of this. That's me, though. Um, so, I'm, so we are unfortunately at time. I'm going to hand it over to Miranda to talk about next steps. But I really want to encourage folks to keep having these kinds of conversations, to keep staying engaged in de further developing this kind of a collective vision, um, and to keep broadening who we are having these conversations with. I think that's extremely important and how we're going to get to the kind of transition we want to see. Thank you. All right, folks, that was an amazing conversation. Thank you for hanging out here for us with us for this evening. Um, now we're at the time where we need to figure out how we take this amazing envisioning, this, uh, these ideas that we have, and turn it into reality. And to do that, I think one of the things we clearly identified here is we need everybody in this room to get involved. So you all have a yellow piece of paper that says, take action at the top of it. Please fill this out before you leave uh, and hand that to me or one of the other leaders at this conference or at this uh, event. Um, there's a bunch of things that you can do on here um, to take action. First, you can sign the petition for 100% renewable energy. You can attend an event. There's the September 8th Rise for Climate, Jobs, and Justice uh, People's Climate rally in March at Zeidler Park <coughs> at 1 p.m. Um, there's also, just a quick plug, there's an event uh, around the Oak Creek Power Plant on uh, Saturday, August 11th called the Ride for Renewables. We're going to do a bike tour to see just how dirty we energy's coal plants are and actually talk to some of the neighbors who are most directly impacted. So uh, think about joining us for that. There's flyers for both um, up here if you would like one after. Um, you can share the information on social media, such as Facebook, Twitter, and other pages. You can get your organization, church, or other group involved. Meet with your alder person, write a letter to the editor, help with event planning, get involved in the campaign more broadly, or take other steps that you um, might be thinking about. But in order to do this, we do need to be able to reach back out to you so that we can all be working together and on the same page. So please, 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 do fill out this form and let us know if there are specific actions that you would like to take. Uh, and with that, we'll close it out. Thank you so much for coming. I'm so excited to see the energy in this room and the what we can achieve if we all work together. We had a 350.org do a climate chat. Okay? Water is sacred. Water is sacred. Keep it in the ground. Keep the oil under the soil. Keep the oil under the soil. Keep the gas under the grass. Keep the gas under the grass. Keep the coal under the hole. Keep the coal in the hole. System change. System change. Not climate change. Not climate change. Renewable energy. Renewable energy. Sustainable life. Sustainable life. Peace and love. Peace and love. Thank you.